We now move on to our next speakers who are from the U.S. To talk about the innovation in artificial intelligence and interaction analytics, please welcome to Data Scientist of Call Miner, Ms. Kirsten Stallings, and the Vice President of Call Miner USA, Mr. Rick Britt. There we go. Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for having us um, having us over to the Philippines. Even though we couldn't get on an airplane this time, we have to do it via video. But we're excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I have with me, uh, my, my name is, is Rick Britt. I'm Vice President of Artificial Intelligence for CallMiner. And CallMiner is a software platform that allows organizations to understand the communications and the conversations between customers and that organization. And so we're a interaction analytics software and we're excited to come and talk to you today. I have with me Kirsten Stallings, who is a data scientist with us as well. And she actually is on the front lines of artificial intelligence. Kirsten, you want to tell them a little bit about you? Sure, Rick. Um, as you said, hi, I am Kirsten Stallings. I am a data scientist at Call Miner. Um, my background is in computational linguistics, which is a real thing. It's about uh, teaching computers to understand natural language. So in our case, we are a we deal with call centers, so um, understanding call center data. Outstanding. So if you get a chance, let's go ahead and start the presentation and we will we will take you through our, our conversation today. Excellent. You can go to the next slide. Wonderful. So I know we're talking about benchmarking and, and benchmarking in, in our world um, is extremely difficult. If you think about an operation, all of you have customers or patients or, or people who enjoy your businesses. But how do you truly benchmark yourself against uh, other areas and other businesses? Um, a lot of times it's the metrics that are readily available, the things that are are simple to get your hands on. I think back you know, 25, 30 years ago, there was the Big Mac index, which was the price of all the Big Macs sold around the world, the Coca-Cola index, the price of buying Coca-Cola around the world, and it gave you a feel for the different cost of livings in each environment. We use those indices because they were readily available. Today, that isn't good enough. Now we need to know how to compare our organization to itself, each department, each team, each area that touches the customer. And we also need to understand how to compare our organizations to others especially if you're in the call center industry where you have massive BPOs that have multiple clients and you can go to pretty much any shopping facility in Manila and you can see five or six different BPOs sitting on the corners of those. And those BPOs all have the same clients and they're all being compared to each other. But how do you compare a business? How do you compare a customer oriented business if you don't have all the data of that organization? A friend of mine used to say, and I love the quote, I used to have the best job in the world until we got metrics. Life is really easy if you don't have to measure much, but the minute you have to measure things and have to pay attention to it, you realize where all the gaps and all the dirty laundry are. What we happen to work in the world of artificial intelligence as it relates to human to human conversations. And what that is, is taking two humans talking to each other, two people, and using machines to better understand what's going on and help either or both of them have a better communication. This is really powerful work beyond just using it for business. This is powerful work in understanding how humans actually relate to each other. It's a very interesting and very forward-looking research team. Now, while we work for a software company, Kirsten and I are lucky to be on the front lines of what's called natural language processing or NLP. NLP is the world of humans speaking and using machines to understand that, either robots to humans, humans to robots, or humans to humans. The hardest is the last one, and that's what we get to focus on. Next slide, please. Fantastic, so how do you get to understand what your customers are saying about you? Well, the traditional method is observation, which would be something like a survey after the call, or maybe you have a quality assurance department who's inspecting interactions, secret shoppers. There's a variety of ways businesses try to understand what's going on in their organization. Maybe they, they actually record the phone calls and then some portion of those are even being listened to, to hear the voice of that customer, to hear the quality of that agent, to hear what's going on in that space, or to understand what's being said about their products. Next slide, please. The difficulty with observation is we can't listen to everything. 
Every single hour of customer communication to a business takes one hour of human time to listen to it or understand it. You can read a little faster, so you can usually read something faster than someone can type it, but how many emails could you really read in a day? And how many people does it take to read every single text that's being sent to your bots or to your, to your agents? It's an impossible task. We just don't have enough money in our organizations to do that. So what are we going to do beyond just sampling? Next slide, please. So the goal of sampling, usually for most companies, is to take the least number of calls, usually from a cost perspective, that's going to represent all of the data. And all of the data might be um, the norms that you have to follow, different kinds of calls or interactions, but regardless, you want to cover all of them. But as you can see in this slide, we took a sample, and when we stack out the sample, we see that that black, um, standard or parameter is highly represented, while the purple and the orange are barely represented. And then there was this red parameter that didn't make the sample at all. So although we do our best to cut costs, is it really fair or representative to just take this small sample? Now, a lot of times organizations will force distribute these samples, perhaps in this particular example, all the black phones are the most common or most important interactions that, that that particular organization is looking for. And then the green and the blue and the orange and the purple are less important or areas that they don't care to focus. And I'll give you an example. We had a client of ours who, before they bought our software, were taking a look at the phone calls of their agents using random sampling. And they, they would have these interactions where the customer actually purchased something, actually completed a purchase. They were very interested in those. And so the lion's share of their sampling was focused on those moments when someone bought something or maybe was offered a product and didn't buy something. But what they didn't look at was when agents were leaving answering machine messages, they were calling the customers back, trying to find them, maybe give them something else on that particular interaction, but they didn't really want to listen to voicemails because they're not really important. You call the customer back and you just say, oh, well, well, uh, you know, Mr. Jones, please give me a call. My phone number is, is 1-800, call me back. And then I, they would move on. Now the agents were self-identifying these calls. They would mark the message machine and then they would move on. When they got our software, they took a look at every interaction in their entire stack, so 100% of all interactions. And what they found was message machines were generally message machines. But then the agents, when they had a really bad interaction with that customer, one that the company would not have wanted to hear and possibly could cost them to lose their job, they were just marking it message machine because no one was looking at that pile. Agents figured it out very quickly. Not all agents did it, but enough bad actors were yelling at customers or getting angry at them. And they were just tucking those away in that little red call over there that never got heard. Obviously with our software, they were able to rectify that just a few hours by telling people to stop that and then we could find them all. It didn't take very long and a few reports printed and off they went. But it gives you a feel for how sampling is very complex and really struggles to get a true voice, a true benchmark of what that organization is working on. Next slide, please. Operational demands are getting more and more complicated. I keep talking about voice of the customer, net promoter scores, these surveys that you would do. It's becoming important that companies not only understand that they're giving good service, but have a benchmark within the organization or across organization to know that it's doing the right thing. Net Promoter Score, if many of you are familiar with that, is a very complicated metric. You take the top two, uh, one through 10 score, nines and tens are added together. You forget the eight, sevens and sixes and fives and you subtract off the, the fours, threes and twos. And if that net number of nines and tens minus the bottom chunk is greater than zero, you know that you have a good Net Promoter Score. That's not the exact way to calculate it. Every organization calculates it differently. We also have voice of customer scores. This is specifically on the customer channel. How do you score them? How do they score the company? New things are VOE scores, voice of employees. Are your employees happy? Are they getting the right information? Are they telling customers the right information? More and more subjective judgments are entering into this environment of random sampling and professionals trying to look at enough calls to get a good valid sample size. Because remember quality assurance protects the company from bad actors in the organization and from things that the, the customer acting as fraudsters or other areas. QA is to protect the organization. In a BPO, it protects the organization and it protects the people doing the outsourcing. These are extremely complex things to calibrate. How do you truly calibrate someone who's giving fantastic customer service? 
Random samples oftentimes now are looking for other random samples. You survey 10% of your population and one tenth of 1% of those actually respond to that survey, creating a few thousand surveys a month. And I'm listening to 5% of all phone calls and 5% of all phone calls equals a few thousand a month. I have to hope there's overlap. I have to hope that those samples now find other samples, that I can find relevant things in that population that can be judged and graded to help the organization get a better voice of customer score, get a better net promoter score. The coaching requirements in the organizations have never been greater. All of you in every industry know how hard it is to find talent and to improve that talent. And what are the right things to improve them on? The things that we believe are correct are exactly what the customer wants. Benchmarking a customer is incredibly hard. What this usually results in is what we call a lowest common denominator approach. A lowest common denominator approach is where you take the worst group of agents in Pareto's law, the bottom 20% that cause 80% of all of your problems. And you generally coach the entire organization as if they're in that 20%. Everyone needs to do this going forward. We need to say this to all of our customers, even though some of those top agents don't do that. Do you wanna leave them out? Is that important? If you don't have 100% sample size, you don't know. If you can't look at the population, you just assume that you found the five calls or the five interactions or observe something that's going on everywhere in an organization, even though it may not be valuable when you're taking time and passing that to 80% of the population when it only really is 20. Next slide, please. So imagine the complication now as you begin to judge emotions in interactions. How do you calibrate the difference between anger and frustration? I know a lot of you will do work through the US and work with US companies. Do Americans have the same definition of anger and frustration as someone in the Philippines or Australia or China or Europe? We all are a product of our environments. We're a product of where we grew up, nature and nurture. And because of that, it's difficult for Kirsten to have exactly the same definition of the line between anger and frustration as I do. And it's calibrating large organizations. It becomes very, very frustrating. Next slide, please. So what ends up happening? Generally, then we script the people who interact with our customers. We go the lowest common denominator way. In these instances, we take a very complex thing like anger and frustration, and we require someone to say something. And those of you who work in an environment where you talk on the phone, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Empathy. Empathy ends up sounding like a script. Every agent ends up saying the same thing in that particular call center. Same thing when you're standing at a point of service machine, when you're selling a hamburger, when you're sitting at the front desk of a hospital. I'm so sorry to hear that. That sounds difficult for you and your family. I'm not sure how you guys made it through. Would you please take a seat and we'll be with you in a moment. It's scripted, it's not real, because it's very difficult to calibrate. It turns very complex emotions into a standard script. And customers notice. It's hard to benchmark when you're at that level because the customers are already frustrated when they're talking to you and now they're getting what they hear on every call when they call in and their cable isn't working or their telephone doesn't work right or perhaps the wait is too long in the queue, they're getting the same story. Next slide, please. Now, this slide had a lot of animation. That pile of black phones at the bottom, that puddle, actually goes shooting by at a very high rate of speed. There's several hundred phones down there. They just go zipping by this little robot on the left. And on your right-hand side, there's this, this, this human being who actually gets sorted out these three red phones. So imagine, close your eyes, and imagine, well, don't close your eyes. I don't want you to do that. Please look at the slide and imagine the phones are flying by. Uh, machines are good at certain things. They are fantastic partners for today's operations. Machines are remarkable. They're so good at classifying enormous amounts of data. A machine can tell you that an interaction passed the snuff, every single one. And then it can find those anomalies, those areas where it didn't pass that bar and fire that into a queue. And the reason they fire it into a queue, they can even classify it as it goes into the queue, as Kirsten will say in just a moment. The reason that they do this is so humans can inspect it further. A machine is always calibrated. Right or wrong, when you tell it to do something, it does it. It will never not do that thing that you asked it to do unless you unplug it. It will just keep doing everything you asked it to do. If you change its instructions, it changes its calibration. So you can, you can always get consistency. What a machine lacks is real world context. 
I haven't been to Manila in a few years, but I don't think there's robots walking down the street. I know the UAE is very big into robots, but I still don't think the robot cities are completed yet. Robots are not humans. Humans are remarkable at cognitive reasoning. They can look at an interaction and they can tell you what's going on. They can tell you the context of it. They can say, oh, that's a screaming child in the background where a robot may never have heard that before. Humans excel at the real world, at reasoning through big problems. AI, for all of its dazzle, is very narrowly focused and does things very, very well, but in a small, small window. Humans also tend to like working with other humans. Maybe not every other human, but they do like working with other humans a lot more than we like working with machines. We try to make a machine look like that little, little chap on the left that's all white and slick and standing there as if he's really, machines don't really look like that. They sit in server racks, they have red and green lights on them, about a billion wires coming out the back, and they generate a tremendous amount of heat. That is what it is. It is not an attractive robot that you will see. It's just a really warm box, usually black. Not very pretty, very, very big, and making a lot of noise. That is why humans like to work with humans better. Next slide, please. So as Rick was mentioning, right, there are robots that are very good at specific tasks, but the types of specific tasks they are very good at are varied. So for example, uh, AI is good at rule-based decision-making. So if you would give it a set of rules, if this happens, do this, if this happens, do that, um, the AI can execute that flawlessly. And AI can also uncover relationships. So when dealing with AI, you're usually uh, looking at lots and lots of data. So thousands, millions of data points, be them transcripts of phone calls, um, emails, uh, survey data, all of that can, um, the AI can uncover the relationships. So what leads to um, a, a sale or a no sale? Similarly, AI can uncover patterns. So if there's a series of steps that are, um, AI can find that, as well as predicting outcomes. Will I make this sell? Will the customer come back? You might have seen a lot of uh, stories in the news about uh, self-driving cars, and that's where image recognition occurs. When a self-driving car is going down the road, it's saying, is that a soccer ball on the road or at a a pedestrian and what should I do based on that object in the road. Similarly, in NLP, natural language processing, we do something called entity recognition, which is pulling out the people, the places, the thing, products from text and tagging those. AI is also great at summarizing text. So if you have a manual, we can boil it down to a paragraph and grouping similar things together. We're gonna dive deeper into that in just a moment, as well as identifying outliers. So what are the few and rare things that are happening that we need to know about? Next slide, please. Yep. Next slide. There we go. So we're going to focus on um, these four AI approaches. Um, just give a little bit more detail about those. We have them labels as approaches to QA, but as we walk through these use cases, um, I'm sure you can imagine thousands of other use cases, not necessarily in QA, but in the whole um, realm of quality. And those are classification, regression, clustering, and anomalies and similarities. So next slide, please. So classification, this one also had a build where all the phones move, so you're going um, to miss that. But the goal of classification is you start with a question. So something like, was the agent empathetic to a customer's concern? And you give the machine a set number of options, so yes or no. Um, you can do this in non-binary tasks too. Um, so for example, classifying uh, something on a scale of one to 10 or identifying a set list of categories. And so what the machine does is you first take data and you label it as whether or not the agent was empathetic in this case. So thousands of calls, yes, the agent was empathetic, no, the agent wasn't. And then you sh um, give them to the algorithm and the algorithm learns to pick up on certain features. From there, the algorithm is a sort all of those calls into yes, empathy, 
and no, not empathy, as well as give a probability. So those edge cases where it might be empathetic and might not be, the algorithm is able to say we're only 52% sure um, that that's the case. Uh, next slide, please. So regression is another form of machine learning. And those uh, familiar with data, uh, particularly Microsoft Excel, might have done a lot of regression in the past. So regression is looking to create a shape, so a linear or parabolic um, based on the data. So if we look at the graph on the left, each of those agents is a point representing number of training hours corresponding to an MPS score, so any sort of satisfaction survey. And on the graph on the left, you can see that as the training hours increased, the MPS or survey score increased to a certain point. And after that point, it leveled off. So a business could take this regression model and figure out what's the optimal amount of training for an agent so that we're not sending them to unnecessary trainings, but we're also maximizing the possible score. Now on the right, we see a different shaped graph. And this is the same y-axis as the score, but on the x-axis, we have hours on a shift. And as we can see in this graph, as the agent takes a moment to warm up, they're at their peak halfway through the shift, and then over time, they start to fade. And so what this could tell a customer is, okay, how long should a shift be? Or when should an agent take breaks? And again, making business decisions based on data. Next slide, please. Clustering. Oh, this slide's a mess without the animation, but we're going to make it work. So the clustering of, uh, in this case, interactions, focuses on the context. So what are the words saying? And there's a lot of ways to um, say a particular concept. So for example, um, if you are trying to express that you are frustrated, you might say frustrated, annoyed, perturbed, irritated, but all of those words kind of mean the same thing. Or ways to put on hold. Hold, pause, give me a moment are all representing hold language. And what clustering can do is learn that words used in similar contexts or in similar ways um, be, uh, mean the same thing. And so what all those little phones should do is move into those circles where we have the concepts. What's different about clustering than classification is that for clustering, you don't have to tell it how many circles or what those circles mean. Uh, next slide. Perfect. So assuming all of those calls moved, we now have our circles. And when we dive into each of those clusters, you can start reading about the different um, facts and put labels on those clusters. So if we look at the bottom left corner, something like agent avoidance. Those calls might cluster because there's a lot of silence or there's a voicemail and then the agent doesn't hang up, right? Just spending time. But the clustering algorithm doesn't know that. But we as people can sample a couple calls from those clusters and figure out what that means. Next slide, please. Now, the next two uh, types that I'm going to dive into are anomalies and similarity. And I have them on the same slide because although they are opposites, essentially, it's pretty much the same math. So on the left, we have anomalies. And that's about finding a call that is different and abnormal. And so finding the one bad call is often like finding a needle in a haystack. And so the anomaly detection works by defining what is normal by looking at all the data, removing the hay from the haystack, and what's left are the needles. So finding those things that happen rarely, and, um, oh, I lost my, rarely, <laughs> we'll just go there. And why that's useful, we're not saying that it's a bad thing that happens rarely or a good thing that happens rarely, but you're able to uncover what's hidden in your data. On the other hand, it can find calls or interactions or data points that are similar to a selected data point. Where this might be useful, say you had a great call where the customer is giving compliments to the agent. And the way businesses work, you show it to a supervisor, it somehow works its way up. A very important person listens to the call and says, I want to hear more calls like that. 
And the way someone is complimentary can vary very uh, differently based on the person. So you can't just search the same words. And so by deriving features from the call, we're able to take one purple call, go through the data and find five, six, a hundred more purple calls that are similar to the call selected. Next slide, please. So Rick's gonna tell you what this all means. So we're going to grab uh, some use cases for you so that uh, this gets a little more real because we know artificial intelligence can be daunting when you're staring at it uh, in its algorithmic form, but it really falls into place when you understand how people use these. And so from our, our, our pretty large client list, we thought we would just throw a few, few use cases. So a great use case for classification is something we call entity extraction. Um, this allows you to go into any, any interaction if your customer is a recorded phone call, is a text, is an email, uh, however, tweet, however they get words to you. Entity extraction can go in and classify and pull things out. A lot of our clients want to know things like, can I get uh, the name, phone number, and email address of everyone who called me? Well, of course, an agent could gather all that phone, they could type it all in the system, or you could you could go through each of those those tweets and you could look and see if a phone number is in there. Uh, entity extraction is a machine learning algorithm. It learns what those are. And this is really interesting, especially when you think of how complex it is for people to refer to things. In an email, an email address is simple. It could be ricky.brit at yahoo.com. Very simple email address. But if I'm giving that over the phone, I could use something like ricky.brit at yahoo.com. It's really hard with addresses. And especially because in conversational language, people hitch, stop, and start over. Uh, my address is 123, I'm sorry, my address is 132 Main Street, North, uh, Main Street West, any city USA. That's very, very difficult to pull that out. Entity extraction actually can begin to extract that and pull that and put it into a file. That's an example of classification and what machine learning can do. And that's every interaction that has that information in it. Regression is incredibly powerful, especially if you're looking to optimize an organization. It's a tried and true statistical technique. Nothing surprising there. A lot of people are familiar with it. What it will do is take things like, what are my MPS scores based on agent tenure? It takes two different things and it compares them and says, okay, do I have a slope when it comes to agent tenure and MPS scores? What time of day do I get my highest MPS scores? What time of shift? Where should I spend my time? Who should I train? Because you can pick out areas on a, on a regression and pick a decile, 10% of it, or a, a twintile or a, a percentile, and you can pick out small wedges and pick out who's in that slope and work with them. Clustering is even more powerful. It's hard to get your brain around, and Kirsten did a great job with her slides, but it's really hard to get a brain around how you would use this. And I'll give you some examples that are really fun. We had a client, a large uh, retail client on the internet. You would know them, I'm sure. Um, and they, we, we clustered all of their calls and it came up with a general amount of clusters for words is somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 different groupings of words. Each of those could have anywhere between two or three words and short phrases up to a few hundred, uh, depending on what those clusters look like. And we found a cluster, machine didn't know what it was, but it put together things like oatmeal, salmon, periwinkle, yellow, blue, orange, red, green. And that was a color of sofa pillows that they sold. And the machine knew that those strange colors like salmon and periwinkle were not food, or I'm sorry, periwinkle, salmon and, uh, it doesn't matter, canary were, were not food, but they're actually colors. And if you transferred that to other companies when things like food came up, that client would know that it was a hardship. Or colors for a credit card company, usually are brands of plastic, platinum, gold, silver, those are what come up in that particular organization. The machine will still cluster them together. One algorithm does all that. It just knows that these things are colors. And we tell it, that's a color. And so then they go through and identify it. We can, we've done that with a huge algorithm to identify almost all the clusters in any client so we can go in and say what's going on in there contextually. This is really powerful when you wanna search because no longer do you have to search my words. Going through and trying to find, when's all the times a customer did a competitor mention? Well, typically you would have to look for either the word competitor or one of your competitor's names and keep doing that until you find them all. Now you just look for the cluster of competitors and it brings back all the interactions and all the places where 
that was mentioned. Finally, uh, anomaly detection. We love anomaly detection in data science. It's fantastic. This is one of the best ways you can imagine to find bad behavior. It will just pluck out calls where customers are cursing. It'll pluck out calls where agents are doing things they shouldn't be doing. It'll pluck out interactions where things aren't going the way you want them to go. It takes the entire population and identifies things that don't belong, or even more confusingly, it identifies the things that don't belong before it looks at the population. But we have the ability to use machines to go forward and backwards through populations and find things that don't belong. We can find things that are similar too. Next slide, please. So we just got a five minute warning. So I'm going to kind of speed through some of this. Um, and unfortunately without the builds, it's terribly hard to see. Um, but the point of this slide is that humans and AI are two completely different entities. And there are things that humans can do that AI cannot. And there's things that AI can do in a much more efficient way than humans. So it's not about robots taking people's jobs. It's about maximizing what humans can do and what AI can do to better drive your business. Next slide, please. So we have a Great. couple different- uh, I'm gonna actually, and say so we have five minutes left, let's just go to, let's go just go next and next. We'll just go right to the end, everyone. I apologize for, machines would always be on time. So if you can go next slide. <laughs> And then Thank next slide. Up, but... There we go. And there we are. All right. So let's talk a little bit about us. Why not? CallMiner and our platform Eureka is the software that we use to de derive everything we just told you. It's a user interface that takes any interaction of your organization, as long as it's either recorded or in some sort of written form, even Zoom transcripts, you can pull and push into, into our software. Anything that's put in there then runs through this API layer and this, this software layer, and it pops out into multiple products. The first one is Analyze. It allows you to go deeply through your organization and completely analyze all the interactions that are going on, find the, the best practices, find the root causes of problems, generally get a feel for what's going on, specifically get a feel for exactly what's going on. It's very powerful. Not only does it analyze, but it allows you to tag those things for the future. So if you find something of interest, you can find it every time that it happens. And it also allows for you to pull all of that information back out and do data science on it on your side. There's a visualizer in there. Any of you that look at data as much as we do, love to have it in a visual format. Who doesn't love a chart as opposed to a rack of numbers? But we have a visualizer product in there built on Tableau, very powerful. And then we have a coaching platform. This is actually a social media-esque platform that allows an organization to move moments of coaching between agents and supervisors and quality assurance officials, whatever it is, and then share, share feedback on it. Listen to these 20 seconds. Tell me what you think about it. Read this little piece of this text. Can you tell me what you would do there next time? And then hold them accountable to doing it with scores and automated uh, interaction marking. We have a real-time version. So as the customers are interacting with you, we can alert agents to do things. We can alert supervisors that they're not doing things and we can build custom alerts we can even send an email to the CEO from this platform if you want to say something just happened you might want to know about. And finally, we offer redaction products. All of this is on top of the ability to remove things that organization, organizations don't want permanently, like credit card numbers. We can pull numbers out of interactions and scrub the recording so that a, a company never has to have sensitive, sensitive data in their recordings ever again. That is what CallMiner does. Great, final slide, please. We just want you to leave you with one final thought from CallMiner, oh, there we go. We just wanna leave you with one, one final thought from CallMiner, and that is benchmarking across an organization and across the world is extremely difficult. The best companies are already in artificial intelligence and already understanding what's going on in their interactions. If you're interested, give us a ring, you'll see our, our emails in there, and it'll be an email, not a ring. Also, we have our APAC uh, leader here as well, Grace Holly, um, who, who uh, works ex exclusively in that region. So we're happy to talk to you about what we do and share more information. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Ms. Kirsten and Mr. Rick for that wonderful speech. We are now opening the floor for a short Q&A. Please submit your questions to Slido using the code 45616.
Our first question, this can be answered by Kirsten or Rick. So it says AI takes the human out of the call center at transaction. How do you balance the need for more humans in call centers since machines cannot replace humans? So we, this we can be- We have a very yes. strong, we have a very, and I'll let Kirsten follow along. We have a very strong ethos at our company. We actually don't plan to replace humans with machines. We fully believe that humans should be in the loop at all times. Our software encourages humans to always interact with the data. We're really not comfortable with, with removing someone's employment or hurting someone uh, who is getting a bonus because a machine got something wrong. And that's why we believe that putting things in a machine queue that a human can look at is vastly important. And ethically for that. First, one of your thoughts. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, we often say it's about Okay, our second question can be answered by either of our speakers. Most humans in call centers today cannot answer difficult questions in many cases. Apologizing simply doesn't do it. How could you change that situation? The, the easiest way is to use our real-time product, which as the questions come up, it can actually feed the knowledge management from the company's knowledge management systems right to the screen that the agent is looking at. And so they can answer the questions on the fly without having to type them in or missing them altogether. The AI platform. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Sorry. Sure. No, you're okay. Go ahead. Okay, we proceed with um, our last question for this session. In promoting AI and analytics, how do you think it can survive amidst the global pandemic in developing countries? that lack resources we, we've done quite a bit of work in in this area and how we actually can can survey through the call center op operations the effect of covid uh, on organizations um, we have the ability to identify it when it's in a conversation and also then begin to allay that to what is going on in that particular environment how the agents talking about it how are the customers talking about it and how is the company reacting or or not reacting to that. It's been a really powerful way that our software has been used is to read the pandemic from the organizational level and begin to understand how it is affecting that organization, how that organization can respond. All right, thank you very much. That concludes our question and answer portion. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Kirsten and Mr. Rick.